Do not set out on this quest with the expectation that you will succeed at first try. Your betters have gone before you, and fallen to the last. Yet do set out, and strive. Learn what you can, and when you fail and your light is extinguished forever, despair not, for many more answer the call each day. What? Despair not? What? Your betters have gone before you and fallen to the last? And it's telling me just not to worry and it's just fine and dandy? What? Hey everyone, Sir Ben here. So, as you may or may not have heard, we are all in lockdown. So that means I'm recording this video from home, so I do apologise if the audio quality is not quite up to speed to what it usually is. And this video is going to be a bit of a, a different format to what I'm used to. I'm trying something out that's a little bit new here. Um, but let me know how it goes. If you like this format better than the last couple of videos, let me know in the comments. Or if you want me to do videos like I used to, then by all means let me know as well. But yeah, I thought I might just try something new today. Anyway, welcome to the next episode of Underappreciated Video Games, where we will be looking into For the King, which is a relatively new release. It is a turn-based strategy RPG. It contains roguelike and tabletop elements, and I'll talk a little bit more about how those things are incorporated into the game as we go. But the devs of this game have really done a good job of combining a whole bunch of different elements and making something that is just fantastic. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into it and we'll see where we go. So straight off the bat, we have a whole bunch of different game modes that are available with the base game. For the purposes of this video, I will just be doing For the King, the normal story adventure. You can choose the difficulty. Uh, Apprentice by itself is actually quite challenging. I've completed a couple of games, but my first few attempts just ended in Valiant Failure. And then the house rules. So you can choose a whole bunch of different settings. Uh, I'm going to go into what all these different things are as we go along, and I'll leave economy inflation is, as is. Yeah, and we'll just jump straight into it. Character creation in this game is pretty straightforward. Um, you have different uh, classes to choose from. So you can go through all the different classes here. I don't have the hobo unlocked. But um, you can look at the classes and look at the class info. So each of the characters have different stats, okay? So you have your strength, you have your vitality, you have your intelligence, you have your awareness, you have your talent, and then you have your agility. And all of these different stats do different things in the game. They mostly affect combat, however, but they, they do affect everything in the game and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that all happens but i like a well-balanced team so i'm going to choose the blacksmith because it's got quite reasonably high strength and good vitality so he'll actually be my tank as i've shown there and then my next one will be my scholar he has very high intelligence but you know, relatively low strength and vitality so he doesn't have a lot of health but he has the capacity to do a lot of damage and then i think i'll stay with the herbalist uh actually no you know what i'll do i will use the woodcutter who doesn't have quite as high vitality as the blacksmith, but his strength is a little bit higher and he has the potential for a much more physical damage. So I've got my tank, my magical damage dealer, and my physical damage dealer. Good King Bonner has been slain. The once powerful kingdom of Farul is being corrupted by wild chaos energy and ravaged by monsters and bandits. The grieving queen Rosamond has called for Farul's ordinary citizens to search the land for the king's murderer and the source of the chaos energy. The tale now begins in the Guardian Forest, where there have been rumours of suspicious activity and sinister strangers in the woods. Three would-be heroes meet in Orton to begin their quest. So this is the world map. As you can see, it runs off a pretty simple grid-based format, and you get basic movement. I'll explain how their movement works next turn. But as you can see, there are towns, there are monsters and beasties. Uh, so with all these hexes, you can see there's little question marks on all you don't actually know what's there and so as you explore the world um, different objects and things will appear in front of you anyway we will talk about all that as it if it pops up and as it pops up but for the moment we'll just peruse around this area so first of all combat uh, as you can see like i've said there are beasties we've got beast men here and when i mouse over them you can see that there is a colored in grid around them Anything that is caught within those red markers will participate in combat. At the moment, you can see uh, that red, the red space doesn't cover Orton, which is where my party is, and it doesn't cover the other Beastman over here. Okay, so I don't have to worry about anything else unless there are some enemies in these neighbouring hexes over here. But for now, what I need to do before I engage in combat with this Beastman, I need to get my party within the confines of this red area here. So... What's pretty cool is, as you can see, I've got one space left, so I can still move a place, but 
what I can do is choose not to use movement points. And when I end my turn, if I was low on health, any remaining movement points I had are used to heal my character instead. So I don't need to move it anymore, so I'm just going to end my turn here. And we'll talk about exactly what happens with movement of my next turn. Because this mechanic is the central point in absolutely everything that happens in this game. Okay, and that is dice rolls. Okay, and I'll kind of, it's like uh, percentage based dice rolls, but I'll, I'll talk about what they are. So I'll end turn and you'll see what happens with my next character, which is going to be Mr. Damage here. Okay, so I'll end my turn, 1 HP, and then bang, I have the dice rolls. See, I missed one. That means that I only have four movement points for this turn. Okay, and my dice rolls for the movement, I don't know if you could see them before, but they were the little running man, which correlates to speed here. Okay, and so what's happening basically here is I've got 75 speed, which means every single time I get a dice roll, it means that I have a 75% chance to be successful in that particular dice roll. Okay, and this, like I said, it affects everything. It affects combat, it affects chance-based puzzles and stuff, it affects movement, everything. We'll be able to see that more when we actually get to combat. And then it's heals turn. As you can see, both of my characters are caught in the red. So I'm able to move over here and engage in combat. Here we have um, the different options for combat. Okay, So I can either fight him, which is when we just straight away engage in combat. I also have the option to ambush. Now, ambush, it says here I've already got a 42% chance to be successful in an ambush, and it basically it means that I get the initiative in the fight and my guys go first. It doesn't really matter because there's only this one guy. However, it is a really good opportunity to explain another one of the mechanics in the game. As you can see when I put my mouse over ambush, it says you use focus. Now, focus are these little gold hexagons down here. And what they do is you can use focus at any time. Again, during movement, combat, or even puzzles and luck-based things such as this to guarantee a roll. So I require three positives to be able to ambush this guy. But in order to get those three positives, it's using my awareness. My awareness with this guy is only 75. So that means I only have a 75% chance of being successful on all three of them. And the cumulative probability of me getting all three is only 42%. However, if I choose to use focus, as you can see, it's used one of my focus here, and it's guaranteed me a successful roll here. So I only need two more rolls of a guaranteed 75%. And as you can see, my success has already risen to 72%. So I think that's high enough to try and do this. So I'm just going to give it a crack. And here we go. Oh, I failed anyway. <laughs> Okay, well, as you can see, if I fail a uh, ambush, the beast man goes first. And once again, we see these dice roll things here. I just realized something. <laughs> I just realized that I called my uh, magical die guy damage and then my woodcutter heals. Oh, well, that's fine. My magic damage guy has a couple of different abilities too. So I can either just flee, which means he leaves combat and he doesn't participate anymore. And then depending on the weapon I have, so my current weapon is a book, as you can see right here. Uh, I have Surge and Area Blast. Okay, so Area Blast is good because I get the area damage, but Surge just attacks one unit, and I don't. I only need to kill the one unit. So I'm just going to hit that, and as you can see, it requires three successful slots of intelligence. I have 83% intelligence, and so it's a 57 chance to be perfect. So I'm just going to give it a crack. Bang, perfect. Awesome. Uh, Beast is going to go again. Oh, I dodged. Nice. Okay, and then same deal here. It requires four successful strengths to um, be able to get the maximum roll. Now, if I don't get one of these, it doesn't fail the attack completely. It just reduces uh, some damage based on the percentage of what I have. So, for example, I've got 12 damage maximum, and I have four rolls in order to get that 12 damage. So 12 divided by four is three, which means each one of these successful rolls means I'm doing three additional damage. So if I get all four, that's 12. If I get three, that's nine, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we'll just try a chop because I only need five damage. So I only need two successful rolls here to be able to kill him. Oh, I got three. Bang. Nine damage, as you saw. Now, loot is pretty cool in this game, um, and it's part of what adds the roguelike experience to the game because every single playthrough, you'll get different bits of loot. Um, now, unfortunately, this particular hat um, is not really good for any of my guys because none of my guys have talent as their main stat. However, it does offer one resistance, which is down here. That's your magical armor and one max focus, which is 
always good. Focus is always good. Okay, so what I might do is I might equip this to someone who, so this guy has five focus by himself. So I'll equip it to one of these guys. I think I'll equip it to Mr. Heels over here, who's not really a healer. He's a woodcutter, but we're just, it's, it's fine. And you can see the little hat goes on there. He looks very dapper. Ah, oh, yes. Mr. Heels. Mm. Love it. Right, I'm actually going to try and be successful with this ambush here, so I'm going to use two. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh no! Okay, yep, cool. So it's pretty easy to see how the game utilizes all the dice rolls and such for the mechanics. And I think it's really cool. I actually really like it. Um, sometimes you can really get gypped on, uh, on your RNG, as you have seen in this example of the game. But other times you just get like, just godlike luck and it's just fantastic. It's all about doing what you can to maximize your effectiveness in combat and movement and everything by increasing your stats as much as you can. Okay, so for example, with my heals man, who's not really the heals man, I currently have 83 strength. The maximum amount of strength I can get with him is 95, which means that it's a flat 95% success rate on all of my rolls, which is freaking amazing. Um, but you can't go any higher than that. So there's still always a chance to fail. And sometimes those, <laughs> those failures are just astronomical. Okay, so I've made it to wood smoke. And so the way towns work is really simple. You have a very simple market, which you're able to buy loot. You have services, which you're able to use to either heal your character or replenish their focus or remove curses or other negative debuffs that stay on your character between combats and then there is the quest board and so you can choose different quests that give different items however you can only choose one once you've chosen a quest all the other quests disappear and you can only get the reward for that particular one okay, so i have the option of reducing chaos i'll talk about chaos a little bit later an item which is actually a very good item it has a potential to break but i only need one success in order to make it work and it does 20 damage which is huge but it requires awareness in order to use none of my characters have awareness so i think i'm just going to go for the gold because i don't currently have any chaos so I don't have to worry about that. I'll just accept that. The quest pops up here. So as far as what chaos is, chaos is a mysterious power that's overtaking the world. And it's represented on the timeline. Each one of these little segments here are days. And it's represented on the timeline here. Okay. And once that reaches the end, I'll get a thing of chaos. Okay. And what it does is it increases the difficulty of the game. It gives the monsters more health, it makes them do more damage, and sometimes it can, it can even affect your dice rolls. So chaos is bad, so you need to reduce it as much as possible. And there's a few different ways to do that. You know, one of the easiest ways is to actually find one of these cult devices. So these cult devices are basically generators of chaos, and if you are able to destroy one, then it will reduce chaos. And they require different skills. So this one requires talent. My blacksmith has the most talent, so I'll see if I can get him to do it, because he'll have the best chances of success with this. So I'll just move my guy up here. Oh, he has a nice day. Look, you know what? So this guy's just got a bonus, uh, which gives him more movement after the end of my turn, so I might just give it a crack, because, I mean, look, he has 75 talent. It's probably going to be alright. Look, I can use focus anyway. So I might just go 1, 2, 81%. Come on! Yes, there we go. Okay, cool. And so I can choose to take away chaos, add a life to my life pool, or minus one scourge. I'll talk about what scourges are when they pop up. At the moment, I just need to remove chaos. Bang, this chaos is removed, and I can just go on my merry way. So, now that we've brought up life, I'll talk about what the life pool is. This is the life pool here. Okay, I have six lives, and every single time a character dies, I'm able to revive them at the cost of a life. You can generate more as the game goes on, but this is what you start with. And if you lose them all, and then your party dies, that's game over. Now, it looks like it's being pretty generous, and yes, it is, but it's doing that for a reason, because this game is actually quite difficult. This is only even on the easiest difficulty. Okay, so I am now within the bounds of this goblin shaman camp which is the quest that i received from wood smoke so i am going to ambush i'm going to use two focus yep, i was successful so we move in and as you can see oh okay the goblins are actually really quick so even though i got to ambush uh <laughs> i actually don't get a huge advantage but that's not too bad actually 
Um, so I might just use my area attack for this one. This is a good point for me to actually explain armor. So blue shields with a number in them reduce the amount of physical damage they receive. However, it does not block magical damage. Magic damage does the exact same, but for magic. And once again, doesn't affect physical damage. So this is why it's a good idea to have a well-balanced team that do multiple different types of damage because occasionally you'll come up against monsters who are extremely strong against or even in some cases impervious to a particular type of damage. And so the only way you can actually do damage to them is with a different damage type. So, for example, my damage guy here, who's my magic user, his surge attack only does 6 damage max, which means that by the time it actually hits the goblin shaman, assuming I get a max roll, it's only going to do 3 damage, which is kind of pointless. However, if I choose one of the other goblins, I should be able to kill him with a max roll. Oh, I, oh my gosh. <laughs> See, this is what I was talking about with the RNG. Sometimes it is just hopeless. Oh my gosh. Goodness, and they all got sped up as well. Okay, here we go. So, uh, it is now my woodcutter's turn. I'm going to attack the goblin shaman because he has no physical armor whatsoever. Bang, dead. Love it. Yep, yep, got him. And then this guy. Oh my gosh, he dodged it again. Get wrecked. Oh! <laughs> okay. Bye! So we've got the reward for the quest, which is the 30 gold. So I'm going to share that. And we also get the 10 gold for the combat. I'm going to share that as well. Identify scroll works the same as identify scrolls do in other games. You use it on an identified item or something like that. So there are mimics in this game, for example. And if you want to find out if the chest is a real mimic or if it's a real chest, you can use the identify scroll on it. Oh, there's a chest. Okay. So I don't actually know if this is a mimic or not. So I'm going to use my identify scroll here. Identify scroll. It's a treasure chest. Bang. Okay, so that means I can safely open it. Ooh. Okay. So at the end of my turn, I just decided to move one space. That was it. Okay. And it came across this stone circle. Okay, so it looks like it's some sort of intelligence puzzle. And if I'm successful, I get a permanent buff to my focus. That's actually really cool. The thing is, I cannot focus. So I'm going to have to go by my already considerable intelligence and hopefully be able to get this max focus. So here we go. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, my woodcutter here, who is, oh my gosh, that's going to keep on confusing me for the rest of this game. <laughs> the fact that he's called heels. My woodcutter uh has 75 awareness and so i am almost almost able to make it to these ancient ruins which require awareness and he's the highest yeah he has the highest awareness out of my party so he's the best for that but i don't have enough movement to make it there however he has two focus and what i can do is i can just go pop use a focus bang i can make it all the way there oh no oh it's a dark cave okay that scared me for a little bit <laughs> um so these are dungeons, and that's perfect, because I'll be able to go in here next and show you exactly what a dungeon is. Okay, so these ancient ruins. Now, this is not a random event that just pops up in your face as you're traveling through the world, so I am actually able to focus for this one. Now, if I'm successful, I can get an item, which is pretty cool. Nice. What did I get? Ugh, another bow. I mean, it's, it's not bad, but I just can't use it. <laughs> so again, uh, it's very much a roguelike game in the sense that you kind of at the mercy of the items that you get dropped. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it, but at times like this, I also hate it too, because I most of the equipment I've picked up is actually really good equipment for the start of the game, but I just have no use for it. So now I'm actually going to be able to go into this cave. Now, as you can see, the dark cave, it has a number above it, which is level one. That is the general level of all the enemies in there. The issue is, all of my guys are still level zero. So... It's going to be tough, but I'm going to give it a crack anyway and see if I can uh, see if I can do this. Oh, that's cool. Um, treasure chest. I don't have any identify scrolls, so I'm just going to open this and hope for the best. Awesome. Oh, here we go. This is more like it. Just armor and resistance. So I'm going to give that to my tank so he can actually do better at tanking. Okay, so before I continue in this cave, obviously it's going to be a it's a little bit difficult uh, because it's one level above. Uh, where my guys are at the moment. So I'm going to actually heal up. And so this is where we, where we get to the inventory bar. So this here is pretty much your inventory quick access thing. Okay. 
And in between, any time on the map and in between rounds in a dungeon, you are able to use any of your items. You are also able to use one free item per turn in addition to your attack. So I'm going to use this God's Beard here and then I will continue. Okay, oh, the jelly cube is going to be nasty. Okay, that wasn't too bad. My guy's got poison, but that's that's fine. Ah, one strength. Perfect. So this is perfect for Mr. Heels over here. Yeah, and at the end of the dungeon, we have a chest here, which is awesome. Ah, so Book of Law. I'll explain what law is in a minute, because it's also a pretty central part to the roguelike elements of the game. So law is what I collected at the end of that dungeon, and it accumulates up here, and it's basically like an in-game currency. And what you're able to do is you're able to use law to unlock permanent objects, items, encounters, and characters within the game. I mean, you can get, like, fashion for starting characters. You can get new characters altogether. Uh, new weapons which are not in the base game. And as you unlock more of these, obviously these things have a chance of appearing within the game, and it gives you quite an advantage. So you get rewarded for playing more often and for failing, basically, despite my jest at the start of the video. The more you play the game and the more you fail, the more you are able to unlock all these different things to give you a bit of an edge and to make it more likely that you will succeed in future attempts. There were still a few things that I wasn't able to talk about, as scourges, for example. They just add um, periodic debuffs and uh, challenges to the game. All in all, I really enjoy this game, and like I said, I really don't feel like it's gotten enough love. And also, it also supports online cooperative and remote play so you're able to actually join together with two other friends and you're each able to control a character and have like a three player playthrough which is awesome i've done it with a couple of friends of mine and it's a lot of fun so this has been for the king please go and check it out like i said it has not received enough love and i think it is a brilliant game that has done something fantastic for turn-based strategy genre and it's done a really good job of incorporating all these other different elements and mechanics within it and yeah, I, I really think it deserves the love, guys. So please go ahead and pick it up and you can get it on Steam. I'm sure that you will enjoy it. Once again, if you have liked this format of me kind of being a little bit more interactive with the actual gameplay instead of just talking over captured footage, let me know because I actually really enjoyed this. And if you would like to see more content like this, please consider going to our Patreon and Subscribestar and signing up there. But that is all I have for you today. And so until next time, remember, the Ben is mightier than the sword.